If you're a Christian, I'm pretty sure you've got an opinion about Calvinism, or what you might know as Reformed theology. Actually, you've probably got a very strong opinion about it. But whatever that opinion is, I believe at least one thing is beyond dispute. Over the last few years, we've seen this huge resurgence of Reformed theology. Today, I want to talk about how that happened. I want to talk about where it came from. Today we're talking about the New Calvinism, or Reformed Theology, or maybe you know it as the Young Restless Reformed Movement. Whatever you call it, I believe we, we can trace its beginnings to the church growth movement, of all things. You need to remember that this church growth movement was huge. It was so influential in the late 90s and the early 2000s. You had leaders back then like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels who had, they had grown their churches into some of the biggest, some of the most influential in, in all of the United States and really all over the world. They were writing books and they were leading conferences and, and they were essentially advocating a form of pragmatism, Christian pragmatism. Pragmatism is all about judging the rightness or the wrongness of an action by the results it brings about. So it begins with this, this good goal in mind then assumes that whatever brings about that goal is necessarily good. The result that church growth leaders wanted, it was a good goal. They wanted to see lots of people make professions of faith in Jesus Christ, a very good thing. But it's the way they got there that proved to be so troublesome. To get people to hear about Jesus, well, they first needed to get them into church. But here's the thing, how do you get people into church? And especially when most of those people have a church background. They've already tried church and they've rejected it. What you do is you change church to make it more appealing to people. That might mean you have to strip out any elements that might make people feel uncomfortable. It might mean you would add elements that will motivate people to come and to stay. Probably it means both. So at its fullest bloom, church growth was serving the people in the community around a church to ask, what would it take to get you to come to our church? And then they had to of course, deliver those things. Okay, so church growth wasn't all bad. There was a new emphasis on removing barriers for people who are unchurched, uh, assessing our churches to ensure that they were doing things with excellence that was good. But what happened is that churches began to completely redefine themselves so they would be appealing to unbelievers. Instead of going to the Bible to ask questions like, what does God say churches must be? Or going to church history to say, how have Christians understood God's commands about church, about worship? People instead turn to unbelievers and they ask them, what do you want in a church? And so some things began to happen. Sermons became short and topical instead of longer and expositional. Doctrine was stripped away to focus instead on meeting people's felt needs. Those long prayers or longer prayers that have been part of Christian worship, they tended to be pulled out and replaced only with short prayers of response and commitment. Old hymns, they went by the by and were replaced by new choruses. Even the word church was removed from many congregations just in case that word alone would be a hindrance to people. You might remember slogans like this, this is not your grandparents' church, or this is a church for people who don't like church. Well, at its worst, church growth led to a kind of almost a programmatic big box Christianity. It could be bought and sold. It could be transferred and duplicated. The promise was if you copy our model and you implement our programs and you preach our sermons, you just watch. Your church will explode in growth. This led to a, a kind of church that felt very impersonal. A church that had really lost all sense of the sacred, of being set apart from everything else. Doctrine was shelved and forgotten. Church became all about the numbers. Well, not surprisingly, a growing number of people began to express concern with this movement. And they responded in two very, very different ways. One group determined, we will focus on recovering authentic Christian community. They began to refer to themselves with names like the emerging church or simply emergent. And what they did was they called for a new kind of Christianity that downplayed theological distinctions in favor of authenticity, in favor of community. They tended to meet in small and local gatherings where they could foster online communities. Their leaders were people like Brian McLaren and Tony Jones and Rob Bell. And this movement did generate that sense of community, but theologically, 
we watch them drift right back into the theological liberalism of the early 20th century. That authenticity they wanted. It often came at the expense of sound theology that had been drawn from the Bible. And without robust theological grounding, that, that movement quickly drifted. It, it faded. It's probably been a long time since you've even heard of the emerging church. Well, there's a second group that was pushing back against the church growth movement, and this one determined they would focus on recovering authentic Christian doctrine. And they would do that by going back in time to the theology of the Protestant reformers. They called for the recovery of doctrine that had been forgotten, that had been neglected, or that had been displaced, doctrine historically known as Calvinism or Reformed theology. This began as an organic movement, then grew by connections made especially through the internet, through this new medium of social media. Social media, blogs, and then Facebook and Twitter, it led people to, to books, to podcasts, to sermon archives, and conferences, and churches. People began to gather around this, this handful of Reformed preachers, people like John MacArthur, John Piper, R.C. Sproul. We started to see D.A. Carson and Tim Keller start to play key roles. Then a new generation of leaders rose up, led by people like Albert Moeller and Mark Dever and Ligon Duncan. And then they brought with them the next generation of leaders they had identified. So Kevin DeYoung and Matt Chandler and David Platt. Well, soon this movement began to gather in conferences like Together for the Gospel, started small, grew to 10,000. Organizations like the Gospel Coalition began to try to define, to try to organize the movement. Christian publishers, of course, turned their attention to the movement. First, they released hundreds, then over time, thousands and thousands of books by this group and for this group. Well, Christian and mainstream publications, they began to notice it, and they, they started to describe and define the movement with, with names. So Christianity Today pegged it with Young, Restless, and Reform, Time Magazine with The New Calvinism. Well, the movement continued to grow, it continued to spread beyond America and across the world. And today, you can visit pretty much any country in the world and you'll find people who consider themselves a part of this movement. Okay, so there's just a little glimpse of where this movement came from. And, and it's clear to me, very clear to me, that God has been at work in and through this Reformed resurgence. But of course, it's a movement that involves human beings. So it can't all be good, can it? It won't all be good, will it? It's just, it's impossible. So in the videos that follow, I first want to identify God's grace within the new Calvinism. I'll offer my assessment of some of the strengths of this movement. Then I want to turn it around. I want to suggest just a few of the weaknesses that maybe this movement needs to address in the years, in the days, in the months to come. Well, I hope you found this little introduction helpful. If you did, why don't you hit the like button or consider subscribing so you can be notified about the next videos. And hopefully, I'll see you again really soon.